Hello and welcome to the Political History of the United States, Episode 1.4, The Reformation. For the last two episodes, we have focused primarily on the political question in Europe during the 16th century. We look specifically at England and the rise of Henry VIII, as well as Elizabeth, as well as the English victory over the Spanish during the Anglo-Spanish War. This week, our survey is going to turn to the question of religion. During the first two episodes of our tour, religion has already played heavily into our story. It has been the cause of warfare throughout Europe and specifically in England. Likewise, it was the cause of several attempts on the life of Elizabeth I. The Reformation is a critical turning point, not just for our story, but for the entirety of Western history. Since the fall of the Western Roman Empire in 476, the Church has remained amongst the most politically relevant and powerful entities in Europe. Suddenly, that power and influence that the Church had yielded for centuries was called into question. And it should surprise nobody that this would lead to decades of strife and conflict throughout the continent, which we've already started to see. The Reformation would send shockwaves throughout Europe that's going to last from the 1517 publication of the 95 Theses up until the 1648 Treaty of Westphalia. We are going to spend time this week looking at what caused the rift in the Church, dating back to the Great Schism, corrupt popes, and the sale of indulgences. These are the actions that are going to lead to the general distrust of the church and the belief that it had become a corrupt entity. And it's these things that men like Martin Luther will flock to when they begin debating the issues that existed within the Catholic Church and the eventual separation from it. We are going to take a brief look at the effects of the Reformation, as throughout Europe people began to look at the religious question. As the church began to lose its influence over portions of Europe, it made desperate attempts to cling to the power that it once had— Europe is going to enter into a period of over 100 years of warfare as the church and the monarchs who support it fought to preserve that influence. Finally, we are going to turn back towards England and look at the special case of the Church of England. Unlike the decisions by the academic Luther, the Church of England was founded for pragmatic reasons instead of a theological dispute. Henry VIII needed an annulment from Catherine of Aragon, which the Pope refused to grant. In response, Henry VIII rejected papal authority and began the English Reformation. Religion is going to remain near the core of the story as we move through this podcast. Several episodes from now, we are going to begin to look at the Puritans as they prepare to cross on the Mayflower, largely driven by religious persecution. Likewise, in the United States, even up to this very day, religion remains closely tied to the politics of the nation. We will see time and time again how religious movements directly influence the politics and directions of the country. I mean, when John Kennedy ran for the presidency, there was real concern that, as a Catholic, he was going to be subservient to the Pope. Religion is going to end up being a central theme of this podcast, because it is so often impossible to separate it from the political questions being raised. Before we jump in for today, I do want to note that I'm going to do my best throughout this episode to go through it with a minimal amount of theology. I am a million miles away from being anything resembling a theologian. If you're looking for the religious history and causes of the Reformation, you are in the wrong place. Today, I plan to focus solely on the events leading to and the effects of the Reformation politically. I do not plan to delve into the theological reasons and the changes stemming from the Reformation. I would like to begin by looking at what caused the Reformation in the first place. The simplest answer is that concerns over growing corruption in the Catholic Church is what proved to be the ultimate cause. However, this alone is underlined by other pressures that were present at the time. The invention of the printing press by Gutenberg the century prior had made mass dissemination of ideas much more practical and more proved to fuel the movement. A general feeling that the church was becoming more corrupt had begun to spread by the later part of the 15th century and into the early 16th century. And while there were multiple reasons for this feeling of corruption, mainly they stemmed from the Avignon papacy a century before. The issue that will bring everything to a head, however, is the church's practice of selling indulgences. Now, what is an indulgence? An indulgence is a method whereby a person can avoid punishment for a sin where they have already been forgiven in terms of guilt. Without going too deeply into church doctrine, what this basically means is that if a person confesses their sin, by purchasing an indulgence they can either avoid punishment in the afterlife or shorten the length of that punishment. To receive an indulgence, there are a few basic requirements. The person must have been baptized, 
They cannot be excommunicated, and they must be in a state of grace at the time that they receive the indulgence, which typically means they have gone to confession and confessed their sin. Indulgences can be purchased for individual use or, beginning in 1476, can be purchased for use on somebody who is already deceased. Indulgences did not come cheaply either. By the time of the Reformation, they generally cost between 1.2 and 1.5% of a person's annual income. The church did place some limitations on what kind of sins an indulgence could be used on. Indulgences could only be used on temporal sins, not the much more serious mortal sins. Mortal sins are the serious sins in the eyes of the church and are viewed as a separation from the person committing the sin and God. A temporal sin or venal sin is seen as a much more minor action. If murder is a mortal sin, giving somebody the finger in traffic is a venal sin. For the church, the sale of indulgences was a major source of revenue. Indulgences were always something that were in high demand as they presented a product that could offer salvation to you or a loved one in the afterlife. Indulgences were not an invention of the church during this era. However, they had become much more common and widely sweeping prior to the Reformation. It appears that these changes likely started around the 11th century by bishops throughout France and Spain. Had it been the situation where punishment for a sin was having to fast for a week, a local bishop could sell an indulgence that might reduce that punishment to a single day. The expansion of indulgences by local bishops grew and developed between the 11th and 16th century. What had once been something that was meant to flow through a pope as a reward for good acts had become something of an economic tool. In this vein, by the time the 16th century begins, indulgences have become a primary source of fundraising for the church and a critical component of its economy. A big part of the problem economically is the important role of indulgences for the local economies and for indulgences sold from outside the papal states. A sale of an indulgence acted much in the same manner as a city bond would today, as a method to fund public works projects. Things like hospitals and schools were often run by the local church, and they came to depend on the funds from the sale of indulgences to operate. Problems arose from the fact that the funds being raised in Germany were then having to be shared with the papal states. Imagine passing a bond to build a school in your small town of 25,000 people, and then being told that a percentage of the bond was required to be sent to the national capital thousands of miles away. Indulgences were largely viewed among the population the same way. We are the one paying for these indulgences and for our building projects. Why is that money being sent to the Holy See? What this leads to is an increased anti-clerical and anti-Italian sentiment throughout Germany. And this helps explain why the German people were so willing to accept the Reformation when it came. Tensions reached ahead in 1517 with the rebuilding of St. Peter's Basilica. St. Peter's had fallen into a state of disrepair during the Great Schism when the papacy had relocated to Avignon, France, something which we're going to talk about a little bit more momentarily. In order to rebuild the basilica, Pope Leo X issued an indulgence for anybody who would give resources to the rebuilding of St. Peter's. The problem in this case is that while indulgences had long been used for public works projects, it was generally something that was viewed for the public good, again, like building a school or a hospital. But this was different. The rebuilding of St. Peter's was a project not to help the community, but something that would only benefit the church, and specifically Rome. The church was not hiding this fact either. This was an ostentatious project. The church hired the leading architect of the day, Raphael, to design the new church. Elaborate art projects were commissioned for the new basilica. All of this to benefit primarily one man, the Pope. By this point, indulgences have moved from being a source of salvation to being a business venture. The nature of this particular indulgence infuriated Martin Luther. Luther writes on number 27 of the 95 Theses that they preach vanity who say the soul flies out of purgatory as soon as the money thrown into the chest rattles. I think this particular quote by Luther sums up the anger nicely. By this point, there was not even the pretense anymore that indulgences were anything more than an economic tool, with the product being salvation. It is the sale of salvation that is the impetus that pushes Luther to write on the corrupt nature of the church. 
Luther did agree that the Pope had the power to grant a pardon. However, he took specific issue with indulgences being used as a source of fundraising. In other words, Luther did not view repentance as something that could be purchased. The sale of indulgences fueled a general sense that the church had become increasingly corrupt. 100 years before Luther, the church was coming to the conclusion of the Great Schism, which occurred as a result of the Avignon Papacy. This event had laid the foundation for an underlying feeling of distrust towards the institution. The entire legacy of the Avignon Papacy had left a bad taste in the mouths of the collective population. While the feelings of corruption were rampant during this time, the other aspects of the Reformation that cannot be ignored is the ability of the new Protestants to disseminate information on a much more massive scale than the church. In the 1440s, Johannes Gutenberg had developed the printing press. What followed, though slowly at times, was a cultural revolution. Much of this revolution manifested itself during the Reformation. Suddenly, information could be reproduced and spread at a rate that had been previously unfathomable. This was seen across society in numerous ways. Printing also had a major effect on scholarship and theology. Prior to the invention of the printing press, a large portion of the work being done was the process of copying text. If a book was deemed important enough, the only way to preserve it was to copy it by hand. This is a task that fell to the theologians, as they had the education necessary to read and write, something critical when making copies of texts. The printing press freed up a lot of that time that had been previously just used to copy. This means that suddenly there was a lot more time for independent thought. Thoughts that could be turned into new writing, expressing these new beliefs, which then in turn themselves would be made available in large numbers via the printing press. Furthermore, the sudden appearance of so much additional written material helped push greater numbers of people towards being able to read. To really drive this point home, one study I found compared the number of books on religion published by both the church and the Protestants between 1521 and 1545. During this period, the Protestants published 1,707 works, compared to 992 for the Catholics. At every point during that time, the Protestants were simply producing more material. The Protestants were able to exploit the mass media of their day to spread their ideas and arguments. Meanwhile, the Catholics struggled with the new medium to defend their teachings. Finally, consider that with Gutenberg came a much cheaper and easier way to obtain Bibles. Prior to the invention of the printing press, Bibles were extremely expensive as they had to be handwritten. Now, Bibles became relatively cheap and were something that were now accessible by a much greater portion of society. As literacy rates began to rise, more and more people had access to the Bible and thus were able to form their own interpretations of the text. And while it may be an overstatement to say that the invention of the printing press ended the monopoly that the church held on the Bible at the time, the printing press's impact on theological thinking was profound. Prior to the printing press, it was almost always the clergy that would disseminate the teachings of the Bible. Now, however, the Bible had a much greater availability, something further reinforced by the fact that the Bible was now being translated into local languages, as opposed to just Latin. Suddenly, the ability to read Latin was not a prerequisite to reading the Bible, and this further expands the number of people who had access to the book. With rises in literacy and corruption in the form of indulgences being the two leading factors for the Reformation, the movement still required a spark to ignite. That spark would come from a German monk named Martin Luther. Martin Luther was born in 1483 in Saxony into a middle-class family. By all accounts, Luther was a curious and bright child and lived in a family that placed a high value on education. Luther's father, Hans, had hoped that his son would become a lawyer, something which appeared likely as Martin Luther had already begun studying the law. However, following what was likely an apocryphal story about a particularly fierce thunderstorm in which Luther swore that he would become a monk should he survive. Luther did survive, and it was off to the monastery. Luther made his first trip to Rome in 1510 and would later reminisce of the corruption that he viewed while in the city. While it's impossible to say what the effects of this actually were at the time, Luther would later write about the negative impression he had of Rome itself. 
It is certainly possible that much of Luther's feelings during this time was a sense of culture shock as he traveled around Rome. Keep in mind he had come from a small German city. Likewise, it is also possible that Luther was embellishing those feelings to fit his narrative at the time, as all of these writings were made years after the actual trip. Luther would join the faculty at the University of Wittenberg, teaching theology in 1511. It was through this position at the university that Luther would author the 95 Theses, as well as his other works. While at the time he was considered a humanist, the evidence actually supports the opposite, and that despite using certain humanistic elements in his teachings, Luther held a dark view of human potential in view of the supremacy of God. These feelings towards the view of human potential as compared to the supremacy of God laid the foundation for how Luther would eventually come to see the Pope and his position in the Church. The traditional story of how Luther came to find his beliefs is from an experience in the Tower of Augustinian Cloister. Luther claimed that while in the tower he spent time meditating when suddenly all scripture became clear to him. Specifically, Luther said that through a reading of Romans 1.17, he had a revelation that would spark and push his reformation. The specific line in the Bible states, The righteousness of God is revealed through faith for faith, as it is written, He who through faith is righteous shall live. While the idea of a sudden revelation is a more dramatic telling of the story, it seems unlikely that such an event ever actually occurred. Again, Luther told the story of the tower years after the event supposedly took place, and near the time of his own death. In reality, this story also seems unlikely as evidence supports Luther not being a revolutionary at all, at least initially, something we are going to discuss more momentarily. The events that led to the Reformation reportedly came in late October of 1517. On October 31st of that year, Luther made his disapproval of the indulgence to rebuild St. Peter's Basilica known. As the legend goes, Luther fired the opening salvo of the Reformation when he nailed a copy of the 95 Theses to the door of the castle church in Wittenberg. This date continues to be celebrated to this day as Reformation Day, the start of the Reformation. In reality, the events of October 31st seem very different. Luther did send a letter to Bishop Albright von Brandenburg, where he enclosed a copy of the letter he called the Disputations of Martin Luther on the Power and Efficacy of Indulgences, the work which would become much more famously known as the 95 Theses. Beyond that, however, there is little evidence that anything else actually took place on this date. There is no proof that Luther ever chose to nail his work to the church, and in fact that would go against the likely reality. You see, Luther had not initially intended to be a revolutionary, but rather he had hoped that writing on the matter of indulgences would spur an academic debate regarding their issuance and their use by the church. There's little evidence at this point that Luther was seeking to actually confront or overthrow the church's hierarchy. He viewed his writings as an opening to an academic debate on theology, not a wholesale renunciation of Catholicism. Luther had spoken on the subject of indulgences previously and had never ignited a firestorm like what was coming. More than likely, Luther would have failed to recognize the significance of what was happening. And at the same time, Pope Leo X probably didn't understand the gravity of the situation either. He had long been dealing with the battles of different religious factions, namely the Augustinians and the Dominicans. To the Pope, the writings of Luther would have hardly been a unique problem, and would have initially been little more than an annoyance. What the Pope and even Luther failed to recognize is that much of the public was particularly receptive to this type of groundswell at that particular moment. Luther had struck a chord with people who were angry with what had been perceived as a corrupt institution thousands of miles away in Rome. Luther tapped into this very significant well of anger towards the church in regard to indulgences, as well as the anti-clerical and anti-Italian sentiment that we had talked about earlier. Luther, through his work, had captured their feelings and their thoughts and put them into writing. Luther, for his part, reveled in the accepting audiences he found as he traveled. While indulgences were at the heart of his complaints, he also found acceptance and agreement with his other theological points. This is not to say that Luther wasn't without his detractors, though. Following the 95 Theses, there was a strong call from his opponents that he must return his obedience to papal authority. The initial response of the church was to have a papal theologian by the name of Silvestro Mazzolini of Pierio write against the 95 Theses. This work, 
focused on the infallibility of the church, and in fact went a long ways to cement to Luther that the church was, in fact, fallible, something that his supporters already knew and were more than happy to accept. In October of 1518, Luther agreed to a meeting in Augsburg with Cardinal Kajatin. The hope is that during this meeting, Luther would agree to make peace with the church, something which he continued to refuse to do. At this point, however, it still doesn't appear that Luther was in a place where he was looking to actually break with the church. Evidence still supports that he was looking simply to clarify his positions. And this is going to remain the case in 1519 when Luther agrees again to meet at the University of Leipzig, where he would have just as much of an opportunity to clarify his thoughts. Yet again, however, much as in the case of Augsburg, the thrust of the discussion was focused on getting Luther to return to church doctrine. The final break does occur in 1520, when Leo X issues a papal bull commanding Luther to retract a majority of the 95 theses. Luther responded to the warning by the church in a dramatic fashion. He would publicly burn the papal bull, as well as the works of Johann Eck, a leading counter-reformer of the era, as well as volumes of canon law. Prior to this point, nothing that Luther had done really had that revolutionary feeling to it. All along, he had seen this as more of an academic debate, rather than view himself as the leader of a much larger movement. However, burning a papal bull in canon law? Well, that is a radical move. Less than a month after this, in January of 1521, Martin Luther was officially excommunicated. Later in 1521, at the Diet of Worms, Luther was tried for his heretical beliefs. Luther for a final time, refused to reverse course on his writings. Unsurprisingly, Luther was declared a heretic, and his writings were outlawed and his arrest ordered. Luther would be moved to the castle of Wartburg, where he enjoyed relative security. During the time that Luther was in Wartburg, the revolution continued outside. It is here where the printing press made such a dramatic difference. Reformists were publishing huge amounts of material during this time, and the printing press made the dissemination of information and ideas so much easier, it allowed the ideas and ideals of the Reformation to spread throughout Europe in a way that was previously unimaginable. The writings were getting increasingly radical. Luther himself wrote in the address to the Christian nobility of a German nation that the Pope had become a threat to the good government of Europe and portrayed him not as being the head of the church, but rather as an imposter placed on earth by the devil himself. Luther was calling the Pope the Antichrist. Luther had started a wildfire that the church would struggle to contain for the next hundred years. By the middle of the 1520s, Luther had turned his attention to founding a new church. While there were numerous differences between the Catholic Church and the new church being organized by Luther, for the sake of this podcast, really the only critical thing to know is that the main difference is in the organizational structure. Now, it wasn't lost on Luther that placing himself or anybody at the head of the new church would simply be tantamount to replacing the Pope with a new Pope. Instead, Luther's church placed the Bible at the head of the church, believing that scripture should stand above all else. For a revolution where the printing press was so integral to its spread, it's only appropriate that the Bible itself would become so central to the church. Luther was far from the only voice in the Reformation that would make a difference. John Calvin is often viewed as the other giant of the time. A French lawyer turned pastor, Calvin would make his own break in the 1530s. Through his writings, Calvin would separate himself from many of the Lutherans. Today, most of the Baptist and Presbyterian sects of Christianity can draw their histories to the teaching of John Calvin. Others would emerge during this time as well. With sudden ease, the spreading of theological writings and ideas will proliferate throughout Europe for much of the 16th century. Unlike with Catholicism, there would never be just one type of Protestant. And it's this flexibility that would largely cater to regional differences in a way that a single church never could. And this goes a long way towards explaining why the Reformation was able to spread as efficiently as it did. The Catholic Church was not going to simply sit idly by and watch its influence over Europe slip away. As the ideals of the Reformation began to spread throughout Europe, it became imperative that the Church as well as the Catholic nations work together to turn back the tide. What would result was a century of warfare between the European powers. The fighting following the beginning of the Reformation would be particularly devastating to the Holy Roman Empire, which was at that time made up of mostly modern-day Germany. 
This is the cradle of the Reformation. The people fighting here are the same people who supported Luther from the beginning. Though nearly a century after the 95 Theses was originally published, the Thirty Years' War would prove to be the accumulation of this period of European warfare. The Thirty Years' War devastated the Holy Roman Empire. And the war today can be looked at in a similar fashion to how we would view World War I in terms of its destruction. The sheer length of the fighting and the shocking number of casualties were unlike what Europe had ever seen. I've seen several estimates, however, the number of dead alone may have approached 8 million. I'm not planning on diving into these wars, as generally they're not going to be critical to our story, but here are a couple things you should be aware of. The biggest impact from the wars was in the Holy Roman Empire. However, the fighting would spread all over Europe. Specifically, Protestant rebels in the Spanish Netherlands would fight a struggle that lasted nearly 80 years against the Spanish Habsburgs. The cleverly named 80 Years' War is the conflict that the English would enter during the 1580s that got Philip II so upset and brought on the Anglo-Spanish War, which we talked about in our last episode. The instability caused by the Reformation lasted until the Peace of Westphalia, which was signed in 1648. The peace reached at Westphalia was generally viewed as the end of the Reformation, and this peace establishes a balance in Europe that would largely remain intact up until the world wars of the 20th century. Central to our story, the peace promised the recognition of three forms of Christianity, Catholicism, Lutheranism, and Calvinism. Furthermore, a degree of religious tolerance was agreed to in the peace, at least in how it applied to the other Christians. While the individual nation would decide their official sponsored following, it was agreed that people would be free to practice any of the three accepted forms of Christianity in private without any reprisals. Now, a couple other notes from the Peace of Westphalia. The peace saw the Spanish formally recognize the Dutch Republic, ending the Eighty Years' War. Most importantly for Europe, the peace brought an end to the Thirty Years' War. Interestingly enough, then Pope Innocent X nor the Holy See appeared to have supported the peace at all. However, by this point, most of Europe was very ready to move forward and simply ignored the papal protest to the peace. The Treaty of Westphalia can also be, with some debate, used to mark the beginning of the long and slow decline of the Spanish Empire. We are going to conclude this week by returning to England. Two episodes ago, we discussed the immediate political fallout from Henry VIII's break with the church. We looked at the transition under Henry VIII to the violent purges under Mary I, and eventually the Anglo-Spanish War under Elizabeth I. What we did not spend any time looking at in any kind of detail was why Henry VIII chose to split from the church, beyond him needing that annulment from Catherine of Aragon. So now, I'm going to rectify that. We are going to head back to the reign of Henry VIII for a brief overview of the events that start the English Reformation. Now, as a quick crash course from our episode 1.2, following his ascension to the throne, Henry VIII marries Catherine of Aragon, the daughter of Isabella and Ferdinand of Spain. Unfortunately for Henry, Catherine failed to ever produce the son that he needed, suffering through several miscarriages and producing a daughter, Mary I. When it became apparent that Catherine was not going to produce a male heir for Henry, he was left with essentially three choices. The first choice is that he could wait for Mary to come of age and then hope that she would produce a male heir. The second choice is he could legitimize his illegitimate son, Henry Fitzroy. Or, his third choice, he could end his marriage with Catherine and remarry. Henry was concerned with his own potential lifespan and did not feel comfortable waiting for Mary to come of age. And while he did love his son, the legitimization of Henry Fitzroy was fraught with political dangers. With no other options, and with Catherine appearing to be entering into early menopause, the only option for Henry was to leave Catherine and remarry. By this time, Henry had become interested in Anne Boleyn and began the process of leaving Catherine. Unfortunately for Henry, leaving Catherine was not going to prove to be as easy as he had hoped. Now, getting out of a marriage in the 16th century was not as easy as it is today. For Henry, he was going to have to get permission from the church if he was going to be able to leave Catherine. In order to accomplish this, Henry turned to the Bible where he found a passage in the book of Leviticus. What Henry found was a passage that stated marrying your brother's wife was impure and that the guilty couple shall remain childless. For Henry, this gave him all the answers he needed. 
Henry's argument was that the marriage between himself and Catherine was invalid, as she had been previously married to his brother Arthur. Following the death of Arthur, Henry decided to take Catherine as his own wife, understanding the importance of a political alliance with the Spanish. Now, however, nearly 20 years after making the decision to marry Catherine, this provided him with a way out of the marriage. Now, there was the obvious problem that Catherine and Henry were not childless. Mary existed. And further, Henry had been aware of this earlier, as he had previously gotten permission from the church to wed Catherine. Pope Julius II had granted Henry permission to marry Catherine due to this very problem. Despite this, however, for Henry, this was the best solution he had, and in his mind, it was close enough. Information in hand, Henry sent Cardinal Thomas Wolseley to appeal to Pope Clement VII directly, asking him to annul his marriage to Catherine. Now, on paper, Pope Clement VII had a problem that none of the information being presented to him was new. He was aware that the church had granted Henry permission for the marriage in the first place, and having Henry come back now and claim that it had all been an impediment to the marriage was not seen as a valid argument by the Pope. The Pope, however, had a second, much more serious problem. You see, Catherine's nephew was the Holy Roman Emperor, Charles V. Charles, by this point, was an immensely powerful figure in Europe. This caused considerable issues for Pope Clement. Under most circumstances, he probably would have gone ahead and granted the divorce, for some concessions, of course. Doing so would have upset Charles, something that Clement was not wanting to do. The fear was not unfounded, either. Earlier in that same year, 1527, Charles had sacked Rome and had basically held Pope Clement prisoner. Stuck in this uncomfortable position, the Pope did what most people would do in his situation. He did everything he could to stall. And, to his credit, the Pope did a really excellent job of stalling, holding the divorce up for the next six years. By 1529, it appears that Henry had become aware of a second potential option. We're now 12 years past the publication of Luther's 95 Theses. The Reformation in mainland Europe was in full bloom. Anne Boleyn, being rather well-read, was interested in the ideals of the Reformation, and may have even been influential in introducing these ideas to Henry himself. At this point, it was becoming increasingly clear that the church was not planning on moving on the annulment anytime soon. In 1528, the Pope decided to delegate this matter to two papal representatives. One was Cardinal Wolsey, the representative that Henry had sent to the Holy See to plead the case in the first place. The other was Cardinal Campeggio. While Wolsey was a safe bet to support the annulment, Campeggio was far less flexible. Campeggio, taking a page out of the playbook of Pope Clement, chose to stall rather than actually address the issue. Campeggio did such a good job at this that ultimately the council that was brought together to decide the fate of Henry's marriage had to be dissolved without ever reaching a decision. The repercussions from this saw Thomas Wolsey's fall from grace and Thomas More was sent in to replace him. It is 1529 that we see the Reformation Parliament form. While the original purpose of the Reformation Parliament was to deal with the Thomas Wolsey situation, it was ultimately this Parliament that would end up passing the majority of the reforms that would set the basis for the English Reformation. By the beginning of the 1530s, Henry had become desperate to settle the matter of the marriage. In a dramatic move, he pushed to charge the entire clergy under the statute of Primonari. Primonari made it illegal in England to recognize the supremacy and order of any foreign entity over the monarch. This had been in place since the late 14th century and was seen as a method to check the power of the papacy in England. In other words, Primonari was meant to clarify that in England, the king stood above all others. And while this would be resolved through a financial agreement, it goes to show the rapidly worsening conditions between Henry and the church. Out of patience and with Anne possibly becoming pregnant, Henry overruled papal authority, had a special court convened in England to decide the issue, and in 1533 had the marriage between himself and Catherine declared null and void. Days later, the same tribunal declared the marriage between Anne and Henry to be valid. With the question of marriage now complete, Henry turned his attention back towards the church. In 1534, Henry issued the Act of Supremacy, officially naming himself as the head of the English church. 
This leads to the eventual excommunication of Henry in 1538, though the process appears to have begun as early as 1533. What would follow in England was 70 years of religious strife. England would briefly return to Catholicism under Mary I, before returning to the Church of England under Elizabeth. During her reign, Elizabeth would face constant threats from Catholic detractors, namely Mary Queen of Scots, who made repeated attempts on the English crown. Catholics in England posed a constant risk to Elizabeth throughout her entire reign. Internationally, she also faced pressure from Philip II. It's that pressure with Philip that's going to eventually lead to the impetus for the Anglo-Spanish War in the 1580s. But unlike the Reformation throughout the rest of Europe, the English Reformation still stands apart. In the case of Calvin and Luther, the Bible had been the front and center of the new church. Luther had been cognizant of the dangers of replacing the Pope with a new hierarchy that would simply take the place of the papacy. In England, however, Henry VIII ignored this precedent and placed himself at the chop of the church hierarchy. This is an incredibly powerful move on the part of Henry. Not only is he now the head of state, but he's also the head of the church. Henry is now involved in every single aspect of his subjects' lives. For Henry VIII, he was, in every way, the center of the English universe. Not only did they have to turn to Henry for matters of state, they needed to turn to him for matters of salvation. This is exactly the thing that men like Luther had wanted to avoid in the first place. Henry VIII embraced it. The other key difference between the Reformation in Germany and the English Reformation is that the English Reformation was based in political realities rather than through a theological dispute. By all accounts, it appears that had the Pope granted the divorce in the first place, Henry would never have considered breaking with the church. There is no evidence to suggest that Henry had been anything but a loyal Catholic up until this point. As time progresses, the English church is going to break into different factions. You're going to still have the main Church of England that we know today, however, you are going to see separatist groups appear, such as the Puritans. Now, we are going to talk about the Puritans later, as these are going to be the same people who are ultimately going to travel across the Atlantic and found the Massachusetts Bay Colony. When we reach the episodes on the Massachusetts Bay Colony, we'll start to look into what they were all about. The Reformation is a turning point in the history of Europe and the history of the world. Gone was the age of papal supremacy over the whole of Europe, and in its place came an entirely new church structure. Beyond the immediate wars and conflicts that this would lead to, the Reformation also demonstrates the power of the printing press. And time and time again, we are going to witness the incredible power that comes with the easy and rapid dissemination of ideas. When we reach the American Revolution, in much the same way, we are going to see the power of the pamphlet grow, and the power of mass dissemination of new ideas through written word. It's during the Reformation that this really finds a foothold through the power of the printing press. And at the same time for our story, the Reformation lays the foundation for the churches and religious beliefs that are going to proliferate in the American colonies. I said at the beginning of this episode that the history of politics in the United States is, in many regards, a history of religion in the United States. This is something that continues to ring true today and is a topic that we are going to return to often throughout the course of this podcast. Religion remains a huge driving force, even now, in the politics of the United States. Next time, we are going to continue our survey of Europe right before the establishment of the first English colonies in North America and look at the question of the economy. Throughout the 16th century, the European economy would go through some substantial changes. Europe would begin to move away from the old medieval economies and would begin to embrace a new capitalistic system as mercantilism would begin taking over. I want to thank you for listening, and I appreciate all of the feedback. Positive iTunes reviews are also much appreciated. With that, we will wrap this week up, and I will see you back here in two weeks' time, where we will dive into the always exciting world of 16th century economics. Thank you, and I hope you guys have a great week.